Okay, well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming, uh, for the precious time that we have together to study your word and for your Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. We need you every hour and every moment of every day. You know the burdens upon our hearts, the trials that we face in our day-to-day -day lives, and the bigger issues around us that press upon our minds. Help us, Lord, to trust in you that you have foreseen all things and that we are in your hands, and that those hands will guide us to our destination. Be with each person studying these things, each person in these meetings, and those who watch on YouTube, we pray that you can bless them, that your angels can watch over them, and that you can speak to their hearts through thy spirit. Be with us now as we continue to look at the global reset, the great reset, and um, the issues leading us to 2030. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening. Welcome. Now, two weeks ago, I, I gave a introduction on, on a Sabbath afternoon to this topic. And what I tried to do is I first had addressed um, the issues that led to our understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, or our understanding of it. So one of the things that we, um, that Jeff, this movement has been about, has been about uh, the time of the end in 1989 and relationship to 1798, that we're repeating Millerite history. And we have a chronology that has unfolded in this movement that is a witness to this. That is, we're not just dealing with something that's subjective. And that, uh, that understanding, we looked at um, Vatican and World Par uh, Politics by Avro Manhattan. And we looked a little bit at uh, Louis F. Weir's material. And, and I want to look a bit more at some spirit of prophecy. And also, um, well, this is, these are notes that Jeff put together. So this is spirit of prophecy. But these are notes that, or this is uh, the Time of the End magazine. So he has some spirit of prophecy and some of Jeff's uh, commentary on that. Um, and there, so there's quite a bit to look at. Now, what I want to do is we go through these studies. Um, I'm going to try to, each time we, we study, I, I, I sort of want to bring in some chronological aspects to our understanding of where we are and how these things relate. Now, we know in this movement um, that this movement has been about the Sunday law, the coming Sunday law. And when we spent time uh, going over the foundation, so we we're examining the foundation of this message, Jeff in the 1990s wasn't very different from the average conservative Adventist as far as how he was looking at the Sunday law. And this Sunday law was to be the result of what movement, what movement was happening in the 90s that Jeff was focused upon primarily. Anybody know? What was happening in the 90s that was of particular interest to Seventh-day Adventists? If you don't want to speak up, you can always type it in the chat and I can read it.
Okay, does the moral majority ring a bell with people? Does uh, now. <laughs> okay. So the moral majority was a movement which uh, really began in the 80s, but um, uh, kind of reached its height, at least from my perspective, um, because I became an Adventist in 82. So, um, but by the 90s, it was definitely uh, part of the focus. So Jeff was focused upon what was happening with the Protestants. And of course, he was watching the Catholics as well. And the ecumenism that was occurring so the ecumenical movement of you of these barriers being broken down between so-called protestants and catholics and um of course we had also addressed and jeff had had noticed that um the soviet union um was taken down in 1989. now when we dealt with and, and, and we've touched on this in other, in other places, in other studies. But one of the things that Jeff looked at is there's three different powers. This comes from the spirit of prophecy, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And sometimes, at least this is my observation, some Adventists focus more upon what the Protestants are doing. Some Adventists focus upon what more upon what the Catholics are doing. And there's some of them much more interested in what's happening in the world of spiritualism. So the dragon power. Where should our focus be in understanding what's coming upon the earth? Where, where are we to be watching? Where do we need to place our defenses? so to speak. I know it's kind of a broad kind of question. But if we think about it, um, and, and I've been, you know, I've been an Adventist for a long time now, and, and I know ministers, Adventist ministers, this one minister, Frank Johnson, he collected all kinds of newspaper clippings of anything that in any way related to the idea of the coming Sunday law. And a lot of his stuff was really misplaced. That is, um, he was watching the events of the day and, and yet he was missing things. So, I mean, our focus, obviously, our focus needs to be upon Christ and our relationship with him and so forth. But I mean, prophetically, where, where is the enemy? Like, I, I don't know if it's a good question to ask, but I want you to think about it at least. So let's go through this. So we know that the Sunday law is going to come from the United States. It's going to be the one that's going to make an image to the beast. And how is... How is the Protestant world preparing us to receive the mark of the beast? And by us, I mean just people of the world. Okay, so let's think about that question. So how is the Protestant world doing that? And we could ask the same question regarding the Catholic world, what it's doing, and then we could, okay, so they're going to bring church and state together so that we know that's going to happen. Um, and then we have the globalists, which we would, you know, we can sometimes sum up as the UN, or we could say that that's, um, uh, you know, spiritualism or socialism or communism. There's different ways in which we could characterize that. It's Egypt, it's Greece. Um, all these different symbols that we have. And how are they approaching this? So we're going to look at some spirit of prophecy statements here. And um, these were collected by Jeff. And this was in the context of this is from the Time of the End magazine. So he's, he's studying verse 41 of Daniel 11. 
So verse 41 of Daniel 11 is what we call the Sunday law. So we know that Daniel 11 verse 40 addresses the time of the end, both in 1798 and 1844, or not 1840, 1989, pardon me. 1798 and 1989, right? And then we know that it does talk about this, um, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. He pushes at the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him, the king of the south, like a whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So we would recognize that as the Sunday law. And he shall enter also into the glorious land, which we would say is the United States, and many countries shall be overthrown. Now the word countries is an added word, so many shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So what Jeff is addressing here is this, he calls it the great escape, the ones who escape out of the hand of the papacy. And so he does this study on the word hand. And we had gone through this when we examined the foundation. We went through um, all the articles that uh, were uh, put together as the Time of the End magazine. So he says, um, in this phrase, the word hand is a prophetic symbol which portrays the power and authority exercised by a conqueror. Thus said the Lord, behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of them that seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy, and that sought his life. So that's from Jeremiah 44, 30. He says, see also Zechariah eleven six. When the king of the north enters the glorious land, there are some who escape his hand and some who are overthrown. The word hand is used to represent the power and authority exercised by the papacy when it enters the United States and overthrows many. The authority of the papacy is Sunday observance. So this is things that we're, we're quite familiar with, but, but he's putting some of these things into a framework uh, that I think is really important as we start to look at how these powers, how something like the Great Reset, oh, pardon me, I didn't want to get to there right yet. Um, how that, that affects um, our understanding of what's happening in the world today. So we need these statements in inspiration, in the spirit of prophecy, in the Bible, to really understand what is happening. Now, This is from the Great Controversy 448. As the sign of the authority of the Catholic Church, Papist writers cite the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, because by keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the Church's power to ordain feasts and to command them under sin. That's from Henry Tuberville, an abridgment of the Christian doctrine, page 58. What then is the change of the Sabbath, but a sign or mark of the authority of the Roman Church, the mark of the beast. That's Ellen White, of course, making that other comment. Um, now she says in Testimonies, volume eight, page 117, the sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh day Sabbath, the Lord's memorial of creation. The mark of the beast is the opposite of this the observance of the first day of the week. This mark distinguishes those who acknowledge the supremacy of the papal authority from those who acknowledge the authority of God. So one thing we can see here is that the United States, which is going to make this image of the beast and going to cause people to receive mark of the beast, this is about papal authority. And we know that there are these different powers vying for the control of the world. The United States, used to be the USSR, but, and, and we understand that now to be, because the USSR passed away, it's, it's not Russia, it's the globalists. And then we have, um, of course, the papacy. So the papacy, the globalists, and the United States, these are the three powers vying for the control of the world. 
Now, the question that we're asking is, we have these, these different, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and where is our attention to be drawn? That is, many people look at one or the other in their study to try to understand uh, where we are in history. So we're, this study, so we did a study on the United States, that's the presidents of the United States, and to a large degree, we were then looking at the role of uh, the false prophet in prophecy. And, and we, of course, we're all very familiar with the papacy, but I'm not doing a study on that right now. We're doing a study on the globalists. But we know that each of these powers is, are vying for the control of the world. And yet, we know that uh, they have different methods or different, uh, a different means, maybe, by which they, they plan to accomplish their goal. Now, who's going to win in this battle of these three powers? Who's, who's going to be the victor? Overall, the United States. Okay, you say the United States. Now, who's going to be sitting upon the throne of the earth when all is said and done? Uh, you know, not, not talking about Christ at the end, but as far as these powers. The papacy. Okay, so the papacy. papacy. Yeah. So, so the papacy is ultimately the winner. I mean, depends what you mean by the winner and uh but the goal is to put the pope upon the throne of the earth that's 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 the goal of the papacy now the united states i mean it's had its goals the united states stands for things like democracy and republicanism and for for the rule of law um and so the question is, how do these powers that are vying for the control of the world that aren't necessarily, I mean, the United States is, was really an evil power, so to speak, at least in its inception, but because it has horns like a lamb, but it's going to speak as a dragon, which is its legislation. And then you have the globalists, which in trying to understand this power, this dragon power, we, we could in some way attach it to to paganism, but it's also um, connected to uh, atheism, or at least a rejection of the true God. So, so we have these three different powers, and, and we can define them in different ways. But we know that the papacy exists because it's actually basically paganism in Christian garb. So so we have these three powers that the Bible talks about. And, and right now, again, we're looking at, in this series of studies, dealing with the Great Reset, it's not so much about the Pope or the United States. It's about the globalists, the dragon power, the UN, in what it's seeking to do. And it has its goals, but ultimately its goals are going to lead to placing the papacy upon the throne of the earth. And now why do these three powers unite for a short time? Because we know they're at odds with each other. Now, some people try to they have conspiracy theories that they're all really connected at the top. And I don't believe that. Um, I don't believe that they're all connected at the top. I believe they have their own goals and aims um, of what they think the world should look like. Now, there are some similarities between them. There are similarities between um, the characteristics of some of those goals and aims, because they're all, in a sense, especially when it comes to uh, the dragon power, it's totalitarian in its views, as is the papacy. But, you know, one is not religious, and the other is, and the United States is also a religious power supposed to be at odds with the papacy. 
So that, that's the question we're kind of asking. How does this all work together? Okay, so uh, Angela puts thing about trickery of the hand. So that's um, Proverbs 6, verse 12 to 19. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So a naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness in his heart. He deviseth mischief. Continually he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. It shall be broken without remedy. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceit deviseth wicked, imagination, wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. But yeah, thanks, this is actually a, so when we look at the powers or the methods, the means by which these different, um, parts of Babylon function, we can see that all of these apply. That they're not on the up and up. Everything is in, uh, uh, open. It's, you know, everything that we do should be as open as the day. And that's not the way that these powers work to gain power, to gain control. So these are things that are really the opposite of Christianity, the opposite of Christ's character. Um, okay, so we're going to read a bit more of what Jeff writes here. When Daniel 11.41 is understood in this context, Daniel uses the word hand, use of the word hand, represents the assumption of spiritual authority in the United States by the papacy at the passage of the Sunday law. John's testimony in Revelation 13, 16, that all should receive the mark on their right hand, also uses the hand to identify the mark of the papacy's authority. The enforcement of, Sunday, of the Sunday law is symbolized by the United States coming into the hand of the papacy in Daniel eleven forty one. It is at the passage of the Sunday law that those who escape will escape his grasp, for until then, it is not a legal issue. When Protestantism clasps hands with Catholicism, it is in reality a subjugation to the spiritual authority of the papacy. The symbolic use of the word hand and the movement or march of the king of the north are also used by the spirit of prophecy when addressing these identical issues and time periods. Notice how the word hand is used. When our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will, in this act, join hands with Popery. That's Testimonies, Volume 5, and I believe it's in here as well, that I, I need to find another statement. Uh, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism She'll stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power. And when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. So there's one thing here. Um, has, has this happened yet? Has Protestant, Protestantism stretched its hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power? And has she reached over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism? A any thoughts on this? More, more and more. Okay, so you're saying it's progressive. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, because we could even put before 1989, 
uh, I mean, that was happening, right? Agree. Yeah, I remember going going to the scope masses in the when was that the sixties when Vatican II came in and the nuns were changing into you know they they were dressing more like the world most of them. Yeah. And of course the the uh, Jesuit oh uh, you know urging us to be more open more receptive of our estranged brethren. Okay, now I'm gonna switch to um, uh, E.G. White. Um, so this is a chapter called The Impending Conflict, uh, which Jeff has quoted from. And um, so Ellen White says here, the national reform movement exercising the power of religious legislation will, when fully developed, manifest the same intolerance and oppression that have prevailed in past ages. Human councils then assumed the prerogatives of deity, crushing under their despotic power liberty of conscience, and imprisonment, exile, and death followed for those who opposed their dictates. If popery or its principles shall again be legislated into power, the fires of persecution will be rekindled against those who will not sacrifice conscience and the truth in deference to popular errors. This evil is on the point of realization. So she says this is something that's basically imminent, even in her day. But we can see that this has been progressive. We also know that she writes for our time. That is the prophet speaks more for our time than for their own. Now, so she talks about all of these things that could possibly happen um, that, that we've, we've known about for a long time, the type of persecution that could unfold. Um, so she says, but what has been the course of God's servants in ages past when the disciples preached Christ and him crucified? And after his resurrection, the authorities commanded them not to speak any more, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. So, so we know that persecution's going to come, but what does it look like? And what we have done is we've recognized that in the present time, we're in something that is a type of the Sunday law. It's not the Sunday law itself. And we've seen what the state can do and how it can manipulate the situation. And so we know we can see, even though the persecution we received is, is pretty minor compared to what people in the past have received, we can see that it could easily cross that line. It doesn't take much. And that's what we see when we start to look at this uh, the Great Reset, especially in respect to the COVID-19, how this is a type of the Sunday law, what the goals of, of the World Economic Forum or of the globalists is in restricting our freedoms. Of course, it's always uh, couched in a language that is, you know, beautiful and, you know, they talk about equity and, and all these types of things, but it requires them to remove our freedoms. And what they're trying to do is, you know, maybe what you call a soft revolution or a soft communist revolution. They believe that they can bring about Marxism of some sort, some form, and they can do it without bloodshed. That people are They've, they've got to the point where they can manipulate people enough that they will be happy in spite of the fact they have nothing, that everything is being taken away from them, their choice is being taken away. And, and they may partly be right that we've come to the point where we can, we could, at least for a time, uh, make people happy when we've actually imprisoned them. We can make them 
happy and content with their own prison. But we, we need to understand how this is going to happen. So this is the work of the globalists. This is their goal. But Ellen White's here talking about the Sunday law. So she says, those who seek to compel, co compel men to observe an institution of the papacy and trample up a God, upon God's authority are doing a work similar to that of the Jewish leaders in the days of the apostles. When the laws of earthly rulers are brought into opposition to the law of the supreme ruler of the universe, then those who are God's loyal subjects will be true to him. We as a people have not accomplished the work which God has committed to us. We are not ready for the issue to which the enforcement of the Sunday law will bring us. Is this true today with this movement? Have we accomplished the work that God has committed to us? Not at all. No. no. So, so that's true of us. We have not done that. Are we ready for the issue to which the enforcement of the Sunday laws will bring us? Absolutely not. Yeah. So it, she says, it is our duty, as we see the signs of approaching peril, to arouse to action. Let none sit in calm expectation of the evil, comforting themselves with the belief that this work must go on because prophecy has foretold it and that the Lord will shelter his people. We are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude, doing nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. Fervent, effectual prayer should be ascending to heaven that this calamity may be deferred until we can accomplish the work which has so long been neglected. Let there be most earnest prayer and let and then let us work in harmony with our prayers. So it's not enough to pray. We actually have to take action. It may appear that Satan is triumphant and the truth is overborne with falsehood and error. The people over whom God has spread his shield and the country which has been an asylum for the conscience oppressed servants of God and defenders of his truth may be placed in jeopardy. But God would have us recall his dealings uh, with his people in the past and save them from their enemies, to save them from their enemies. He has always chosen extremities when there seemed no possible chance for deliverance from Satan's workings for the manifestation of his power. Man's necessity is God's opportunity. It may be that a respite may yet be granted for God's people to awake and let their light shine. If the presence of ten righteous persons would have saved the wicked cities of the plain. It is not possible that God will yet, in answer to the prayers of his people, is it not possible that God will yet, in answer to the prayers of his people, hold in check the workings of those who are making void his law? Shall we not humble our hearts greatly before God, flee to the mercy seat, and plead with him to reveal his mighty power? So the reason we're studying these things, all of the different things that we're studying, is it's not just for some intellectual interest. We need to know what our actions are to be. We need to know where we're putting our energies. Much of our studies are making us realize that we are not prepared for the things that are coming upon the earth and that we have to do things to prepare. But mostly, we need to arouse to action. We have to work in harmony. We have a work to do. And, you know, we don't want to be like uh, government uh, workers, city workers at, at a work site where you got one person working and uh, 19 people watching. Of course, I've actually been in that situation where I was the one working when I used to work for a municipality and everybody else was watching me. Um, so we don't want to be like that. Now, there's a lot that she says here. I'm not going to read through this, uh, this whole uh, testimony. Uh, I'm trying to find where. Might not be here. So it's not, I thought it was in this section. Um, I should have bookmarked it. Yeah, so um, 
Now there is in the great controversy. So let me see here. Um, it's in this chapter here, I'm pretty sure. So this is the chapter in the great controversy, the impending conflict. And this is one that we should read over um, on a regular basis. So where should I start? She's going to talk about the the basically the annulment of God's law. So that's something that we can see presently. She says no error accepted by the Christian world strikes more boldly against the authority of heaven. None is more directly opposed to the dictates of reason. None is more pernicious in its results than the modern doctrine so rapidly gaining ground that God's law is no longer binding upon men. Every nation has its laws, which command respect and obedience. No government could exist without them. And can it be conceived that the creator of the heavens and earth has no law to govern, govern the beings he has made? Suppose that prominent ministers were to publicly teach that the statutes which govern their land and protect the rights of his citizens were not obligatory that they restricted the liberties of the people and therefore ought not to be obeyed. How long would such men be tolerated in the pulpit? So obviously we're into the point where they are tolerated. Um, wherever divine precepts are rejected, sin ceases to appear sinful or righteousness desirable. So if we come to this point in the present world, I would think we're coming close, but I don't think we've made it yet. Yeah, well, there's it's, it's getting pretty close. For many people, they call good evil and evil good. Those who refuse to submit to the government of God are wholly unfitted to govern themselves. Through their pernicious teachings of the spirit, the spirit of insubordination is implanted in the hearts of children and youth. This is what we see in the schools who are naturally impatient of control and a lawless licentious state of society results. While scoffing at the credulity of those who obey the requirements of God, the multitudes eagerly accept the delusions of Satan. They give the rein to lust and practice the sins which have called down judgments upon the heathen. So that's, we're definitely at that point in history. Those who teach the people to regard lightly the commandments of God, so disobedience to reap disobedience. Let the restraint imposed by the divine law be wholly cast aside and the human laws would soon be disregarded because God forbids dishonest practices, coveted, coveting, lying and defrauding. Men are ready to trample upon his statutes as a hindrance to their worldly prosperity. But the results of banishing these precepts would be such as they do not anticipate. If the law were not binding, why should any fear to transgress? Property would no longer be safe. Men would obtain their neighbor's possessions by violence, and the strongest would become richest. Life itself would not be respected. The marriage vow would no longer stand as a sacred bulwark to protect the family. He who had the power would, if he desired, take his neighbor's wife by violence. The fifth commandment would be set aside with the fourth. Children would not shrink from taking the life of their parents. If by so doing, they could obtain the desire of their corrupt hearts. The civilized world would become a horde of robbers and assassins and peace, rest and happiness would be banished from the earth. Already, the doctrine that men are released from obedience to God's requirements has weakened the force of moral obligation and opened the floodgates of iniquity upon the world. The courts are corrupt. The rulers are actuated by desire for gain and love of sensual pressure, pre pleasure. Um, the iniquity and spiritual darkness pre that prevailed under the supremacy of Rome were the inevitable result of her suppression of the scriptures. But where is to be found the cause of the widespread infidelity, the rejection of the law of God and the consequent corruption under the full blaze of gospel light in the age of religious freedom? Now that Satan can no longer keep the world under his control by withholding the scriptures, he resorts to other means to accomplish the same object. 
So she's going to lay out basically what's happening with it within Christianity. Um, and there is this one statement um, that I'm trying to follow, find. Um, this one, of course, we're familiar with through the true great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. So one of the issues that, 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 that I've always struggled with, and I'm sure many Adventists have, is how the whole world ends up interested in keeping Sunday and rejecting the Sabbath. And we know that we have these powers. We have the papacy, of course, they're interested in Sunday, but are globalists really interested in Sunday observance? We know Protestants are. So this comes to this statement about the Gulf and, and the abyss. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome and trampling on the rights of conscience. Now, how does this happen? Like, you know, we can see what happened with Ronald Reagan because in their battle with the Soviet Union, he, he, he sought um, the power of the papacy. He's Pope John Paul to help him. They work together to overthrow the Soviet Union. In, in this sense, they're fighting against the Soviet Union. So two powers combined there. But when the third power is joins with the United States, that is when the United States reaches over the abyss, right? So she says the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism, that's spiritualism. And then they will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. So you got the, I always thought it was the other way around, but anyway, um, and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome. So, so we have these two things. Spiritualism is the state of the dead being rejected, the immortality of the soul, and Sunday sacredness combines us with the papacy, how do we can connect this with what's happening presently? What, what would be, what is this manifestation of spiritualism that we see today? How is this, how is Satan working to undermine, because spiritualism is also not just about you know, what happens when you die, but it's all of that fantasy associated with the demonic powers and everything. Okay, so this is the statement I was looking for, because this is what we're addressing here. If we're dealing with spiritualism, we're dealing with that power that can be characterized by globalism, correct? That's what it would seem to be. Yeah. So she says, as spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. What is this about? What is she talking about? Because here she can't talk about things in, in a direct way about our time. I mean, she can't talk about movies. And I mean, she could talk about theater and books and so forth. But when we look at this world around us, and, and I'm not asking you to really do it, look too hard, because um, you don't have to. But we see that the young people are completely caught up in fantasy. What is it that attracts their attention? Games and computers. Okay, games and computers. And but if you're dealing with computer games, are these wholesome types of activities? 
Go ahead. Well, could we could we also boil this down to the the really basic understanding? Okay. Isn't this just idolatry that has been stripped away of, of its cover? Yeah. So so definitely when we look at, at idolatry, um, I mean, one of the things we see in the idolatry of paganism is its licentiousness. It's, its nature is as is the lowest and basis uh, aspects of human nature are what it uses to it. Correct. Okay. If we look at what the young people are watching and doing, um, the video games they're playing, uh, the entertainment, the movies that they're watching, we could hardly, I don't think any of us could watch that without just feeling like just totally being totally shocked. It's hard to believe at how much the world has changed from when I was a child, even though it was already going in that direction. But things have become more and more shocking. You know, without going into detail, we just know that every type of evil, people can kill each other. They can do every type of evil in a video game imaginable. And it's all just in the name of entertainment. But can people be unaffected by that evil they participate in with their imagination? Absolutely not. No. The chambers of their imagery, the thoughts of the imaginations of their heart are only evil continually. This is what they think about. And that evil will be manifest. We're, we're developing a world that is extremely immoral, that has no conscience, that is narcissistic. I mean, we talked about the, what is it, the, the back in the 70s, the me generation or something like that. Uh, I mean, it, it's multiplied exponentially in, in our day. Everything that people are involved in is, for the most part, very few people are interested in truth, in spiritual things. Even when people appear to be on the surface, you know, like with the COVID-19, we have the truckers and of course, you know, they weren't, they weren't licentious at, you know, I mean, there was a lot of Christians and so forth. But Many of these people still are unconverted. And the things that they have watched, the things that they have read, the things they think about, those things are going to be manifest in their characters when they're put into a, a, a position of, of survival, maybe put it that way. Now, this idea then that spiritualism more closely, as spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day. What does that mean, spiritualism imitating nominal Christianity? What would be an example of this? Well, if we if we were Jeff back in the 1990s, what would he point as spiritualism that's imitating nominal Christianity? What was happening? They were calling for a revival. OK, so we saw some of these Christian movements that were occurring which really were just new age. There was almost no difference between them. That is, 
nominal Christianity was also imitating spiritualism, but spiritualism was looking more and more like Christianity. And we got to the point sometimes it was hard to distinguish between the two. That is, some New Age movements talk of Christ or Jesus, but they have all kinds of meditation. And we can see that spiritualism is coming to Adventism through the spiritual exercises. We know the spiritual exercises, of course, originate with St. Ignatius of Loyola, but that's that um, spiritual formation just in, in another form. And, and that was spiritualism re really attached to the papacy itself. So we can see that these powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, even though they have different goals, in some ways, they're very much the same. Sister White, Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Now, it's, it's much more true in our day than Ellen White's day. And as I said, she's writing for our day. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Papists who boast of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder working power and Protestants having cast away the shield of truth will also be deluded. Papists, Protestants, and the worldlings who alike accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long expected millennium. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin. Intemperance dethrones reason, sensual indulgence, strife, and bloodshed follow. Satan delights in war, for it excites, it excites the worst passions of the soul, and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another, for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. Can we see how much this is describing our present day. So I remember when I first became an Adventist and we would read some of these statements and we could see how we're definitely tending that direction. But I don't think we could have imagined how rapidly we would get there and, and how how true it would be in, in all of its elements. I mean, we, we sort of are a little bit desensitized to it, right? Because evil has been all around us. We've been raised with it in our entertainment and everywhere, the licentiousness that exists. We've, we've seen it. We've participated in it. We've been attracted to it. Satan has, has, um, influenced us and only by the grace of God can we be drawn away from its attractions but yet those that don't have God that don't have the truth that don't have light they they have nothing to resist what's coming upon the world so I want to go back to the time of the end magazine here and uh, um
Yeah, so they're gonna reach across, stretch, the, stretching the hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. Now you'll see in this one here, she switches it around. That's why I thought it was different. When Protestantism shall stretch her hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hand of spiritualism. So you can see that these are just in reverse. I don't, I don't. She's just using this descriptive language. I sort of like the abyss better for spiritualism and the gulf better for Rome, but she does both. Um, so, so this is what we see happening. And, and what we're focusing upon in this study is globalism, is spiritualism in its present manifestation and what it's offering. Now, um, we're going to start going through this book here. So this is, I sent this document to people. This is COVID-19, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab. And there's, there's lots in here, but I, I'm just going to read a little bit here. Uh, we're, we're obviously not going to go through this whole book. Um, now they're talking, of course, about the COVID-19 pandemic, and they're talking about it in June of 2020. Um, so they, that's when they wrote this book. And there's lots that they get wrong um, about what actually was going to happen. It definitely didn't get as bad as they hoped it would get. Um, but, uh, you know, back then you can sort of uh, see, everybody was kind of unsure about what was going to happen. Anyway, it says, um, that said, World War II could even be so, even so be one of the most relevant mental anchors in the effort to assess what's coming next. So what they're interested in is what's going to come as a result of this pandemic. And so they frame this um the situation that's going to arise from this pandemic um, as something then that they can step in and provide a solution. That's really what this Great Reset is about. And, and this isn't a new idea. These ideas have been promoted by the World Economic Forum for a long time. But they saw this as an opportunity. So they say World War II was the quintessential transformational war triggering not only fundamental changes to the global order and the global economy, but also entailing radical shifts in social attitudes and beliefs that eventually pave the way for radically new policies and social contract provisions, like women joining the workforce before becoming voters. There, there, there are obviously fundamental dissimilarities between a pandemic and a war that we will consider in some detail in the following pages, but the magnitude of their transformative power is comparable. Both have the potential to be a transformative crisis of previously unimaginable proportions. However, we must be aware of the superficial analogies. Even in the worst case horrendous scenario, COVID-19 will kill far fewer people than the Great Plagues, including the Black Deaths or World War II did. Furthermore, today's economy bears no resemblance to those of past centuries that relied on manual labor and farmland or heavy industry. In today's highly interconnected and interdependent world, however, the impact of the pandemic will go well beyond the already staggering statistics relating simply to death, unemployment, and bankruptcies. And of course, I mean, what we see with this pandemic, as all of us know, is it's really been the pandemic hasn't caused the damage. The damage has really been caused by the response to the pandemic. I, I think we would all agree with that. We know that if, if they had done nothing, but just told us about the pandemic and allowed people to make their own decisions uh, to protect themselves, um, that we wouldn't really have had a, uh, a much worse situation than unfolded. We'd probably actually be better off. 
One is they, they could have allowed, and, and, and this is sort of a bit speculative, but one of the things we see about a virus is that it doesn't really mutate. That's kind of a, a misnomer, but it, it, it definitely changes. That is, um, I would call those changes mutations because mutations implies um, new information being added uh, through, um, uh, what's the word, um, through genetic damage. So, so these would be uh, the ways that viruses change is they actually combine with other viruses. So that's one of the ways they change. But, but anyway, it, it's kind of a technical point. But if you would have allowed people to get sick, the pandemic would have been over a lot sooner and the vast majority of the people would have not died. They, then it means they would have just got sick. They wouldn't end up in the hospital. And we know the virus as it changes, it would have changed differently um, if people had <clears throat> um, acted differently. That is, if we had had more contact, we allowed children who were very unlikely uh, to die from COVID, if we just allowed them to get sick. It would have changed everything. But man is is um, short-sighted, or at least um, people imagine they have more power than they do to stop things from happening. And uh, so what you ended up with was a longer pandemic and um, a lot more um, um, what's the word? Variations of of the virus. So however however we understand it, when you when you change the behavior, the virus will change its behavior. Not that it thinks, but if you have everybody social distancing, that virus is going to become way more contagious because only the ones that are contagious are going to survive. Does that make sense to people? It's a good point. Yeah. So, so our behavior, our reaction to the pandemic changed the way that the, the, these different um, variations of the, the virus occurred, how, how they looked, how they operated. So um, I'm not saying that people shouldn't have, you know, taken precautions not to get sick, but so many of the, the actions that were taken actually changed change the way that that virus was going to behave and and probably the delta wave which was the worst one uh, could have been avoided if they hadn't taken the actions that they did of course it's speculative you know to create a model of how a virus is going to adapt and change um is it is a difficult one but initially you can understand people's fear but as time went on, time went on, we could see that that virus really wasn't that bad of a virus, and and the actions that were taken uh, with vaccines probably did a lot more damage than the virus itself would have, and a lot of the stuff that they call long COVID, and some of the other effects, um, are really effects of the vaccinations themselves that they try to. Um, blame COVID itself for. So there's, I mean, obviously we can't know everything about all of this. Now, the thing that we see here though, of course, that they're talking about some key words here. They talk about a highly interconnected and interdependent world. What is that talking about? What's this interconnectedness and interdependent world? Is the world more interconnected and interdependent than it has been in the past, for instance? Yes. Okay. In what what way is it more interconnected and interdependent? Why why has that occurred? Sharing of information, especially. Okay. So information, also travel. Yes. Um, you know, we can look at the technologies that we have here, such as the internet. Um. I mean, this is a. a an infrastructure that if we didn't have, 
we wouldn't be able to have be having a meeting right now. So, so the world has become more interconnected and interdependent on certain certain levels. But I think we we would have to recognize that um, if we were to to break down that interconnectedness and interdependence, the world wouldn't actually change that much. I mean, things would change, but we would have, it would affect the economy and so forth, which when you have, um, but people adapt, right? So we, we've adapted to this highly interconnected and interdependent world, but we're not dependent upon it. That is, globalism is not our savior. It's, it, it can't... Um, it can't solve the problems that face us because most of the problems that face us are really local problems. They're not caused by globalism. The globalists believe that everything is global and they're using this pandemic as an example of that. Now, um, so some of these themes we're gonna come back to, I'm just gonna zoom out so I can look at this page a bit better. Um, Now they're going to talk about what they call the macro reset. So, and, and we're going to deal with this first example. So just to understand what they're talking about, should they say the first leg of our journey progresses across five macro categories. So again, they're looking at these things sort of as if we're all cattle and we live in this big world and we can just categorize things. Um, and not realizing that most of what happens, most of what affects us happens on a local level, not on a global level. Definitely that we're much more interdependent and interconnected than ever, but our, our reality is much more local. The decisions that we make, that we make, affect us, um, our day-to-day -day life uh, much more than um, these big global conglomerates of governments and so forth. Now, they're trying to affect our life in a bigger way, but, but people are much more resilient than uh, this model that they have of the world um, uh, tries to, to imagine. So it, it, it really, uh, they can't control the world the way they think, but we, we'll see that as we go through this. So they're going to talk about these five macro categories. So the first one's going to be this interdependence here. Uh, so he says, for ease of reading, we travel thematically through each separately. In reality, they are interdependent, which is where we begin. Our brains make us think in linear terms, but the world that surrounds us is nonlinear. That is to say, complex, adaptive, fast-paced, and ambiguous. Now, there's kind of a truth here, but it's misused. And, and and we will be able to see this as we go through this. Um, this is in some way, you, what we see here is that there is a contradiction to God's word of how they look at the world. So they have all these conceptual frameworks and all these fancy intellectual terms, but a lot of this is sort of um, to hide their sleight of hand. It's a sleight of hand. It hides what they're actually doing. So they say the macro, macro reset will occur in the context of the three prevailing secular forces that shape our world today, interdependence, velocity, and complexity. So they're going to talk about these things, what velocity is and complexity. This, this trio exerts its force to a lesser or greater degree on us all, whoever or wherever we may be. Now, we're not going to have a lot of time to go through this, but this is where we're going to start tomorrow is we're going to start looking at this interdependence. Um, so we're going to be doing this tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. my time. Um, but we'll just we'll just read this section uh, here that I have, and then we're going to talk about other things and close up this study for this evening. Okay, if just one word had to distill the essence of the 21st century, it would have to be inter interdependence a byproduct of globalization and technical progress. 
Now, these are, these are the things in which these people imagine that the world functions and operates. So we do know that we have a type of globalization that has occurred. Inter, inter, in, information is the big thing and travel. But the world has become a smaller place. And we know that the world has become so because of technological progress. That is, we, we can travel around the world very readily, which 150 years ago you couldn't. And we also can communicate with people instantaneously around the world. And we can share all kinds of information. There used to be a time if I, if I wanted to study the things that I did on chronology, the only way I could have done so would be to go to a university, a large university, um, where I would have access to uh, books that contain the information that I need. People don't need to go to university to study anymore because everything that's available at the universities in the past and more is available on the internet. And I have tools to research uh, that information. So for instance, when you know, I'm writing a paper right now on August 15th, 1844, the midnight cry, and I can just find all of this on my computer. But 40 years ago, I would have had to go to the E.G. White Estates or, or to Andrews University, and I might have some microfiche I don't know if people, all young people know what that is, but basically it's just photos that you put in this machine and then you could go through all this, these old uh, documents. Some, sometimes you would even have to actually look at the, the paper itself. You might actually have to look at, you know, a copy of the Midnight Cry or the Signs of the Times uh, physically, but they, they did at one point put these things on microfiche and then eventually you know, we got computers, but microfiche wasn't something that was easily transportable. You'd have to go to a place, you'd have to go to a library to access this information. Well, now we can just get this instantly. I can just go online and, and find a book and read it. And I can search billions and billions of books instantaneously for some little piece of information that would have taken me maybe weeks of research in a library to find that piece of information. So, so we live in a very different world and this technological pro progress has distorted um, things. It's distorted the world around us. It's a very different world because of it. Now he says it can be essentially be defined as a dynamic of a reciprocal dependence upon the elements that compose a system. Now, of course, it's kind of a little bit fan fancy language. Um, a dynamic is just an interaction between uh, two things. Reciprocal is that they reciprocate, they go back and forth. There's a dependence and interdependence is just another way of saying that. Among the elements that compose the system. So we have these different parts in a system. And um, so, so these, these changes happen because we can now interact um, with this system, with, with society in a different way. And that's what globalism has done. It's changed things. So global, globalization and technological process, progress um, has changed this. I, I, I don't think it's, it's actually a good sentence they're writing there because it's not really clear what they're saying, but they say the fact that globalization and technological progress have advanced so much over the past few decades has prompted some pundits to declare that the world now is hyperconnected, a variant of interdependence on steroids. And, and they're probably to some degree correct that there is a type of connectedness that occurs uh, between the world that hasn't connected in the past, that hasn't existed in the past. What does this interdependence mean in practice? Simply that the world is concatenated. That is, it's, it's linked together in all different kinds of uh, chains. So it's, it's um, got all these different connections. Everything's connected with everything else. In the early 2010s, some guy named Kishore Mahbubani, an academic and former diplomat from Singapore, captured this reality with a boat metaphor. 
The 7 billion people who inhabit planet Earth no longer live in more than 100 separate boats, countries. Instead, they all live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. In his words, this is one of the greatest transformations ever. In 2020, he pursued this metaphor further in the context of the pandemic by writing, if we 7.5 billion people are now stuck together on a virus infected cruise ship, does it make sense to clean and scrub only our personal cabins while ignoring the corridors and air, air wells outside through which this virus travels? The answer is clearly no, yet this is what we have been doing. Since we are now in the same boat, humanity has to take care of the global boat as a whole. So this is the idea. Since the world has become interconnected, it's become smaller, we now need people at the top, the elites, making the decision for everyone. But is this true? Is this, is this a solution to the problem? What's the problem with this argument? We're going to look at this in tomorrow in a bit more detail. Doesn't it make much more sense for the individual to control his own life rather than for the group to control the lives of others? Yes. Makes oh, much more sense. Yeah. Now, the thing is, they don't realize this. They don't realize the damage, maybe they do, but the damage you get from global control. And, and Ellen White marks this out just even in church organization, where she talks about the fact that those who are doing the work in the field need to make decisions for themselves. The people who are at Battle Creek can't make the decisions for the people who actually understand what's happening around them. That we can make the best decisions for ourselves. They're not always going to be perfect, but it's much better than somebody who doesn't really care about us to make decisions for us. So when the state tries to make decisions about what's best in the best interest of the child, for instance, when you go through a divorce, do you think the state knows what's in the best interest of the child? Absolutely not. No, they haven't the slightest clue. And, and do you think they even care? Yeah, Heidi says, no, they don't. No, they don't. All it is is political. It's all political. It's political and it's monetary. And monetary, yes. So, so what's in the best interest of the child? Uh, the person who knows the best and who's likely to make the best decisions for the child is the parent. Even a parent that's not really a great parent is much preferable over the state raising your children. They'll take children from bad homes and put them into worse homes through the, through the, um, the, the what? Foster care. Yeah. So kids can go from, from pretty bad situations to some way worse situations. Not all the time. But it's much better to have a parent make a decision for a child than the state to make that decision. But yet, the, the people believe that they know what's in the best interest of my children. They obviously don't. Because every child is different, but they don't believe that. They believe that we're all basically the same and that we can, we can make decisions for others. So this is the problem. Because they view this world in this distorted picture, they don't understand what individualism is, what localism is, that they think they can fix the problems of the world at the top. And all they're doing and all they're going to do is make things worse. And it, it's from a basic lack of understanding of how the world operates from a biblical perspective, because they've rejected God's word 
They have no idea what they're doing. So, <clears throat> now as I said, I want to look um, each time we do a study a little bit at some of the, the chronological aspects of this. So I'm just going to go briefly to, to something that we're going to be studying in a lot more detail. Um, so just hang on a sec. For some reason this isn't open. I'll find this in a sec. And, and we're going to be studying this, um, you know, for quite a while. Um, I think probably this series will at least go till um, sometime in July. That's kind of my plan. Okay, so I'm going to share this here. Just hang on. Okay, so these are my uh, PowerPoint, what I call my timeline charts. And I need to find this. And what you see here, this uh, relates to Collins chronology. And this is a um, this is November 3rd, 2020. This is the election where Biden was elected. And we know that uh, his inauguration was 78 days later, which is 1872 hours, a symbol of July 18th, 2020. We also know that um, There is this connection between these structures of these 65 days with these dates in the middle and at the end. And we have all these symbols of July 18th. And we're going to look at these in a lot more detail in other studies. And we also have this January 11th, 2030 date. That's going to be 65 days from the midterm election coming up this November. And we know that Colin didn't really uh, look at this as a period of 65 days. He wasn't predicting anything in that time frame, and I'm not saying that he is, but this provides a symbolic structure uh, that parallels uh, the uh, prophetic mirror starting in 742 BC and ending in 1863. And then we have this period of 2,592 days to February 16th, 2030 and a period of 49 days to April 5th, 2030. So this is the date that we're going to be examining. We're going to do a little bit more on this tomorrow. And we're going to understand what this date means. Why, why we have this date here. So, so we did address it two weeks ago. We're going to look at it again. Um, why I think we're given this date. What it means to us. That is, we're not predicting an event on this date. We're not time setting. We're not saying, you know, Nashville's going to be hit by a fireball there, or the Sunday law is going to happen on this date, or even that this date will, will ever arrive. That is, Christ could come back before this date. <clears throat> or we're saying that this date is a symbol, and it ties to our history. And, I mean, if time goes on, maybe that date will show some significance. But we're not, we're not saying, we're not putting off things till that date. So that's one thing I want to be clear about. And so we're going to be addressing that. But the significance of this date of 2030 and how I arrived at that and why I think it's connected to what's presently happening, because that's where our focus is to be and what it is we are to do, that, that's really the purpose of this study. I know it's kind of cryptic. It's, I'm not giving you enough detail yet. But what we can say is that 
everything that we have been experiencing and all of the studies that have been coming from Odilio, from Colin, from Dwight, from Stephen, um, from, my, from our studies that we have in the mornings, the studies we've done uh, dealing with the presidents of the United States, all of these studies are coming together to give us a picture that is meant to aid us or help us to understand what our present duty is. So that's, that's the purpose of this. And now, right now I'm writing a paper on the midnight cry, which uh, I'm trying to get finished. So I haven't spent as much time on, on preparing for these studies as I should. Um, I'm gonna try to get that paper out of the way, but we're gonna move slowly through these studies anyway. So, I mean, I have a picture of where we're going um, but it's going to take time to get there. It's not going to, we're not going to rush through this. So by the time these studies are done, we should be able to understand fully what this means, why we've been given this date of April 5th, 2030, what it means to this movement symbolically. Now we know that that date and in my other presentations that I address this, it goes to, uh, let me see if I can find it here quickly. This goes to the week of Christ study and, and, and trying to understand what that means, how we are, how this, this study came about, how we ended up with this date. And it has multiple witnesses. So those are things we're going to look at a bit more. I want to Tomorrow, address some of the stuff that we studied this evening, but I also wanted to do a bit more on the chronology. So any final questions before we close with prayer? Not yet. Okay. Okay, well, let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful uh, for the Sabbath, uh, for the precious hours in fellowship and study. We are thankful, Lord, that you have been guiding this movement just as you guided the Millerites and just as you um, had led this movement from the beginning, you continue to lead in spite of us. We pray, Lord, that you can continue to work upon our hearts, that you can bring a conversion in our lives and that we can cooperate with you in the work that needs to be accomplished. Be with each person, bless them and keep them. May your angels watch over them. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.